Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Sitting here with the wonderful Mr. Jay Joyce. Jay, how are you? I'm feeling good. Feeling good. Excellent. And where are you? You're located in Nashville? Yeah. Yeah. I've been here for 30 years now, but yeah. In Nashville, uh, East Nashville now. In the last, we kind of bought this church about eight, nine years ago and started a new studio here. But before then, I was over on the West side of town in my basement, basically. What I love about you is you're super well-rounded. You're a songwriter, you're a musician, you're a producer, you're an engineer. You, you, you do it all. Tell us a little bit how you began. Were you in bands? You sort of morphed into the songwriter producer role? Yeah, I started off in bands, guitar player, singer. I was the guy who kind of uh, would produce the bands I was in without really knowing that's what I was doing. Somebody kind of had to take that figure out what's going where played in three or four different bands with record deals and that fell apart and started another one without ever thinking for a second, what the fuck, what the hell am I doing? You know? Yeah. I did that for a while. Moved to Nashville. Uh, I had a couple bands here and in the meantime, just slowly acquiring some gear, you know, one thing led to another and I just kind of came across the choice of like, do I want to get back in the van and go make a hundred bucks or do I want to make, you know, five different records? I kind of just walked away from the musician thing. Not that I don't play. I mean, I still play all the time, but I don't really go on tour or any of that stuff. I don't blame you. And I, to be honest, that whole career trajectory sounds like my own. I, it makes absolutely perfect sense. You know, having some grasp of you know music and how it's put together and also working with bands you know has been really you know a little bit of a feather in the cap you know to be able to to kind of feel your way around and know like the vibe of a band and that kind of thing you really can't teach somebody you know yeah having that empathy having that understanding of what they're going through is is yep. huge did any of the bands you're in were they signed did you already have the experience of like yeah, yeah. record labels a couple bands were signed yep. uh, i had a band in the late 80s called uh, Bedlam that was signed to MCA, you know, and promotion staff was hired and a new one was hired the day our record came out. You know, I've, I've heard the story from a million different people that, uh, so basically none of it panned out very well. And then I started another band after that called uh, Iodine, which had a more of an indie label thing. So put out some records, you know, got on some movies, I remember your band. I know I had a record of yours. I'm going to quit look at the, the record sleeves. Yeah, it was right before, you know, online stuff. Yeah, it was the same with us with Star 69. We don't exist online. We were like 94, 95, and you literally had to be like 99, 2000, and then, then you exist. Otherwise, you're like, who? I've never heard yeah. of you. We split. I kept producing records, and then those two, uh, the bass player and drummer, joined uh, – Ryan Adams and the Cardinals. So that's where they went. I just kept making records. You're super eclectic. You work in so many different genres. Now, obviously, coming up as a guitar player and understanding guitar players and getting inside their minds must be pretty huge. I'm, ass I'm assuming in your studio, you keep a lot of guitars, a lot of amps, a lot of pedals. In this day and age, I suppose, with the business the way it is and with that not being so mainstream now, where are you finding most of your clients are coming? Is it a lot of independent artists? No, most of it is major label stuff, luckily. Like, decent budget and time to do. But I do do a lot of, just for my own sanity, I do a lot of, uh, you know, we're about to start this, uh, the White Buffalo. Do you know him, Jake Smith? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll start that record on Tuesday, and that's you know, that's a smaller label, but it seems like the the more creative stuff comes out of that world. So I kind of try to try to do a little of both, but we we do a lot of major label country stuff here in town, which is a you know, it's a lot of fun because the session guys are good, and it's like it's just different than working with a band. I mean, they both have their pluses, but it's it's a different deal. Well, I'm, I'm brushing through your discography here. And yes, I mean, you've got Patty Griffin. John Hyatt is a huge deal for me. I'm a massive John Hyatt fan. It was it was great, man. Uh, I was kind of pretty new to the whole game. I think that was right after the Patty Griffin record. And I re if I remember correctly, that record was broke up into two different... I think we started it on like a Capitol Records or something. 
And then it kind of fell apart. And maybe about a year later, we picked it up and finished it. But he's a a sweetheart of a guy. I mean, he's amazing. What a songwriter. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, he's written some of my favorite songs. I mean, obvious ones like Have a Little Faith in Me. I mean, whew, what a song. I'd uh, I'd give parts of my anatomy to have written that song. <laughs> yeah, and uh, remember his uh, band with uh, with Ry Cooter and Jim Kellner was that... Um, yeah, Nick Lowe. <laughs> Nick Lowe. Well, the two albums I think of of like, uh, was it Bring the Family and Slow Turning? The Family, yeah. Yeah, well, great, Slow great turning, albums. Yeah. My first album I did as an artist over here was with Don Smith producing. Um, and, you know, yeah. God rest his soul. But, yeah, he, he would tell me lots of, like, John Hyatt stories. Underrated would be the understatement of the decade. He should be lauded for his talent. But, wow, yes. I mean, so, yeah, Patty Griffin, Tim Finn. I mean, wow, the... the the Finn brothers uh, again. It, it looks like you're you're in a good company with incredible songwriters. The Finn brothers. We were over in New Zealand doing that, where they're like you know royalty there. So it was yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Do you feel that's something that you're a first call for when it comes to like songwriters? People are thinking, oh, this guy's going to know how to really flesh out these songs. Yeah, I think so. I'm good with uh, you know arrangement ideas and how to bring a song forward you know i have a little sensitivity to the songwriter um right being kind of a songwriter myself so yeah yeah i think so yeah i noticed you've got songwriting credits with mark broussard faith hill emmy lou harris little big town thomas rett keith urban there's some great writers there you've, you've you've written with as well eric church is an album that came out this year and you've had a relatively long association with him yeah we've done i don't like nine maybe eight, nine albums. So it's, uh, I started with him, like did his demos. So yeah, that's been a real nice journey. He keeps it interesting. You know, he's, uh, always wants to do something different, uh, which is kind of a rarity in that sort of world. So yeah, the last one that's out this year was three albums. We kind of moved a bunch of gear up to the North Carolina and the mountains uh, into some restaurant that wasn't being used and recorded all up there. So that made it a lot of fun. Do you feel like coming from a more rock background that, you know, when you're working with these, you know, huge country stars that you're bringing different perspective? Because it's interesting. I remember reading something with Brad Paisley like a couple of years ago and he listed like his top 10 artists. (laughs) It wasn't a single country artist in there. It was all like Leonard Skinner. It was like classic rock artists. Do you think there's a sort of for a lot of these country artists, there's a secret little rock child ready to jump out, and they want they want to work with with people that can bring that out of them. Do you think? Yeah, I do. Uh, I mean, I I lived here for years and never mm-hmm. worked on a country record until until Eric really. So I don't know that much about it. You know, I mean, I'm definitely not schooled in. The country's changed a lot, and if if you're working with somebody who it's in their blood, like Eric Church or whatever. Then, no matter what you do, it's going to come off as. So it's kind of kind of adds a maybe some information that wouldn't be there if it was somebody who was kind of influenced by the same thing. With all of that, you know, we're, we're talking about a lot of country stars. Cage the Elephant. How did you get that? Because that's quite a left turn and departure from. Yeah established country uh, man those guys were young um and they're up in bowling green which is about an hour away an hour north right over the tennessee line a friend of mine called me about them we went up there hung out in their basement and watched them play they were 17 you know and man they were good they were really good we brought them into my studio and we cut the first record in like eight days eight, nine days, they were just ready to rip. They didn't know anything about recording or anything, but they were so prepared and fun. That was a lot of fun. That was one of those records where you were kind of like front row to a really great, you know, you just kind of get out of the way and let them do their thing. And it was really, it was really fun. I've got to be honest, the first time I, I heard them, I thought they were from the UK. I, I didn't. I didn't know. I mean, even even the sort of accent, the way the way he sung, the sort of angular guitar work, I, it it sounded like yeah. a you know like a UK band, and I was actually surprised to find out. Yeah, they signed to a a, a UK label at first, so they spent a lot of their early time over there. So yeah, I think maybe that 
that was why, but they, they definitely began over there and they stayed over there for a good half a year or longer. But yeah, uh, yeah, they, I could see how they would sound kind of like that. The first record was different than where they evolved to. Uh, first record was very blues based. Um, but man, man, the performances were just incredible. It didn't matter what microphones or any of that shit. It was just the performances were so, you know, captivating that it was just as long as you got that, you were there. 2015, I'm looking at here. You've got a Coheed and Cambria album. You've got a Fiddler record. You've got a Hellstorm record. Kerry Underwood and Zach Brown band all in the same year. Jay, it sounds like you have a lot of fun. Like you get to move around and work in different genres and get to explore, explore the studio space, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, it's all, it's not as far apart as you would think, you know, when you're in there sort of making, uh, especially if the band kind of knows who they are. I don't have a sound that I'm trying to impose on anyone. So, and it is, it makes it a lot of fun. I feel sorry for people who do the same thing all the time, you know? And some people get locked into that thing and they can't get out of it, you know? Give me a little bit of uh, insight into your setup. Now, I do see the, the, in the just behind you a bit of a console. Or what, uh, what console do you have there? Yeah, it's a, a Sphere Eclipse C. Oh, nice. It's probably... Geez, there's only like two or three left in Pro. We go through this and we come back through it. Lots of outboard gear going in over there. And then there's some kid up there. Right now, it's a bit of a mess. So you, you don't have a separate dedicated control room with Window. You're, tr you're tracking in, in the same room. You're listening in the same room you're tracking. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. I never did that. You know, I started in the bedroom with a, you know, a VS-880, you know. Yep, uh, yep. Patty Griffin, Flaming Red was like two VS-880s, uh, most of it. I mean, later on, we did kind of put it on tape and, and redo some drums and small things like that. But 90% of it was that. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're just hanging out right here, just like uh, talking, hanging out and playing. Sometimes the drums are in the other, in the front of the church, which is a door just kind of closing there, but they can see each other. Amps are in either the whisper room or another side room over there. And everybody's just plugged in rocking. I get PA speakers here that just crank. I find that the performances are just better because everything's much quicker, spontaneous. There's no... Yeah, I have a good idea, and then we're going through a patch paper. We got to go through uh, the glass doors and all this shit. It's it's just very quick. Like most of the time, people are recording before they know they're recording, which is always better to me. It's very odd to be in a studio studio with the with the separation and all that. I just I've done that very rarely in my life. You know, I keep forgetting that people come over here to look at the place and go, oh, "Where do I sing?" <laughs> well, you just sing right there, you know, just sing where you're standing. It also makes studio builds easy because you just buy a building you like and pluck a console in the middle and figure it out from there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's what we did. We didn't, I mean, you know, I treated the ceiling and the floors had holes in it because it was kind of a old crack house. But we didn't build rooms. We didn't tear rooms down. We just threw a console in it and just started working and then we eventually moved the console to the middle of the room it was up on the altar so i just know enough people that built their studio took i mean there's a guy that was building a studio when we got in here and they're still building it you know what i'm saying it's like yeah, yeah i know, know exactly what you're saying yeah they yeah. build it and then when they get done nobody's coming you know so i'd rather begin working you know and then realize okay we should move this there find out what's some sort of go-to stuff that you absolutely love is there uh any any mic pre's are you using the sphere pretty much on everything so oh, all your yeah, drums and everything I've tracking seen, through i've got some old brent Averill neves that i love apis you know we use uh 1176s some special ones some distressors on drums we run a parallel compression thing with the distressors and then you know i've got a few of those uh altec you know the green Yep. I think there's a plug-in with those, with that on it. The green one with the big VU meter yes. on it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, those yeah. are fantastic, yeah. Yeah, I've got two of those, and one of them is sort of customized with direct outs. I got a, a, a B room downstairs, too, that has a MCI console of 4,000. 
or 400 series. And that's a smaller, regular sort of overdub room. But I've got the other Altec um, down there. Yeah, just, you know, the regular Neve API, Telefunken, sort of Mike Priest. I like the BL40, which is a, a kind of a modded compressor that we use for vocals. It's like a an optical and an RMS compressor together. It was an old DJ uh, compressor. It just basically sounds like a really sweet LA3. It's just got that snap. And then lots of guitar amps and pianos and, you know, stuff to make noise. One of the questions that we've asked people over the years is, you know, if you had like just a couple of pieces, what are you kind of, it makes us sort of focus in on things that you find you're using most often. Is there like a mic yeah. that gets used? I mean, I've got a couple 47s that we love. I've got a SM69, which is kind of like a stereo 67 that we use on a lot of things, right. uh, which is a great vocal mic as well as a drum overhead, guitar amp. Yeah, so that's a go-to, the SM69. Most of the guts are in the actual uh, power supply, the tube right. and everything. So it's it's a very thin mic. Uh, so it isn't like a 67, but it really is two 67s. I like a lot of old, like weird mics, so 666, Electro Voice. M582s are great, you know. They're bright. They're real bright. And then a lot of ribbons, a lot of, I got a 44, a 77, love the Coles, uh, the original Royer with the, before they went uh, Phantom Power and all that. BK5, I love, you know, for guitar, you know, SM7, like kind of, uh, uh, I've got an SM7 that I use on almost everybody's vocal that somehow was dropped or somehow it sounds better than any other SM7 I've ever heard. <laughs> Not sure why. It's broken and we don't know what it is. We don't want to know, but uh, that's a real good sound. And the singer can get right up on it, you know? Yeah, and also my engineer, Jason Hall, is just great, you know? I mean, I, we've been working together for 15 years, so he's kind of in on that more than I have been lately. Oh, uh, okay, right. Yeah, I know those. Yeah. It looks a lot like an AKG D9 team. Maybe it isn't what the Beatles use, but it sounds, you know, it sounds good. <laughs> if it sounds good, it sounds good. That's really all that matters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I could take any of these and it'll sound fine. That's It gets a little silly after a while, you know? Yeah, absolutely. There's a difference between ribbon and, you know, dynamic, but... um yeah, it's all about what the people are doing in front of it, you know? Yeah, without a great performance, it doesn't really matter what the mic is, does it? Yeah, it really doesn't. I mean, I've done, like I said, we did records on cassette that came out better than a &M Studio A back in the day, you know? It's yeah. like sometimes things get over th overthunk, you know, when they're in the big room and all the, every every piece of gear you can imagine at your fingertips and something gets lost, you know? There's no limitations. You know, it's nice to be limited. Are you mixing on that console? Or are you mixing entirely in the box? Yeah, we mix in on the sphere. Um, right. Now, we're, we're, I've taken the faders off and they're euphonics faders so that we can literally, because nowadays you got to do so many recalls at odd times, like six months later, somebody wants the S on stupid mix notes uh, turned down and it's just, so we print stems, you know, we print stems. We have, uh, I don't touch my uh, parallel stuff, you know, the uh, vocal smack or the kick and snare or the bass um, LA2A. We don't touch those knobs. If you want it more compressed, you turn it up, you turn a send up. Uh, so we mix on that, uh, we use plugins, you know, we're in Pro Tools at that point. Sometimes we hit tape and then put that in Pro Tools. Yeah. And then we mix back through the, the sphere. But you are working hybrid, so you're using obviously plugins, you know, on your session. Yeah, we're using all the plugins back through the sphere and then printing uh, on a mix bus in Pro Tools. The system has worked like we've spent some years getting it, getting it to where it's, it's 
much easier to recall. You know, that was the main thing was before this, we had an SSL and then yep. it was just a pain in the ass. I mean, just hours and hours of, and it never came back the same way. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting in I front mean, of they're right, but it, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's great, but it, it, it's just tough to, there's so much demand now and everybody's doing their shit on a laptop. So it's real easy for them to recall something. And so we got to make it that easy for us, you know. So talking to plugins, what are what are some of your favorite plugins? The Capital Chambers, of course, the 140 EMT, all the reverbs are killer. I've got a 140, you know, a, a plate, mono plate, but I wind Beautiful. up using the plugin most of the time. Uh, I've got a Cooper Time Cube. I wind up using the Cooper Time Cube plug plugin more than that. It's just more versatile. I mean. My Cooper Time Cube is just that quick little 12 millisecond snap. So the one, the plugin just has a lot more variable. BX20, I've got a BX10. The plugin sounds better than my BX10. I like the API. That's what I mostly use. The stressors are good. The fatso is good. Uh, I've got a 251, a real one, EMT, but we use the 250 a bunch. Fairchild, I like the 660. I just do a couple little crazy things with that. Uh, I just like to smack the shit out of it and cut all the bottom out of oh. like drum overheads and maybe add that when a chorus comes in, you know, just to kind of give it some width and sparkle. Some energy. Yeah. And it's just kind of some length to it. The Harrison, we use a bunch on guitars, the 32C. I mean, the UAD stuff is just awesome, man. It really just sounds so good. Uh, the Dimension D, I've got a CP70. We put the Dimension D on that, and it's like instant old school Peter Gabriel. The uh, Teletronics LE2A, the gray one, I really love personally. So what are you working on next? What's your next project? After Jake, you know, the, the White Buffalo, uh, we'll be doing Ashley McBride's next record. We're halfway through that. Uh, Lainey Wilson. We're halfway through. She's doing really well right now. We're halfway through that record. So a lot of these national records get, we do four or five when they're off the road. And then and sometimes we can't. My preference is to do a whole album in one, you know, in one, two or three week period. At least get the artist and the band here at one time. And then we could mix it after they leave. But Sometimes, it's, especially with the pandemic, it's kind of hard to get anybody here for a, everybody's just kind of trying to make it work, you know, going out whenever they can. So, but we got a couple of records that were kind of already started. Ashley McBride, Laney Wilson. So how do you go from like radio iodine to like getting in a room and writing with people like Shelby Lynn? Uh, well, it's natural, you know, people yeah. hang out, they write, somebody introduces you. I can't really remember how we... Yeah got together but she would come over and we would just jam around i think i even had my band there we were just kind of giving her tracks or her songs some some band you know we weren't really recording i was doing more playing then but yeah we were just playing and then there, i had a track can't remember the song but it wound up on a bunch of movies but it was just a track and she said you know give me the mic and man, she sang it like once and, and the song was done. <laughs> wow. She just sang out of the track. Jay, thank you ever so much. I really thank appreciate you, it. Warren. Thanks for giving us a, you know, a little tour of your studio and, and some background and stuff. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Please leave any comments and questions below. So long, farewell. Au revoir, adios. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.